Sorry. Sure, let's get an away. And so before we start today's um, launch of this event, we just go through some uh, housekeeping. So the location of the nearest toilets is straight down there. If you, You'll see the signs uh, on the outside of this room. In the event of an earthquake, um, we know to drop, cover and hold. Those who are of Christchurch, please, even if it shakes a little, do that. I know we, we wait for the bigger shakes now. If there's a need to evacuate the building, follow the instructions of our staff. The library host people will proceed to this nearest safe exit and then to the muster point. Do not attempt to walk down the central stairway. The muster point is the library plaza outside an overtow, um, and <laughs> if you Google mapping it, it's 52 Cathedral Square. And lastly, just that cell phones, if we could have them on silent or vibrate. So, Noira Takumihi, Ereriana kia papatuanuku, kia rangi, kinga atua, katoa o tene ao, tena koto. Kite mana fenoa o tene rohe, nga mihi ki ngai tuariri. Tena koto hoki, kia ngai tahu, motu o koto manaki tanga i tene wa. Huri noa kia koto katoa e hui hui mai ana i tenei wā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to Space for Planet Earth. My greetings were first to our Earth Mother Papa Tuanuku and our Sky Father Rangi and all the other gods who keep us safe here. To the holders of the mana of this region of Ngai Tuariri and therefore Ngai Tahu. And of course to you all gathered here in person at Tūranga and to our overseas viewers, our communities in Fiji, Nisa Bula Vanaka, Papua New Guinea, Mipla Amamas, Alsam, Yukam Long, Bless Mipla, and in my own native tongue, Samoa, Ma Loli Soi Fo, Malilangi Mama, Afio Mai, Susu Mai, Maliu Mai. And to our communities in Australia, welcome. My name is Whamui Nā Felolingi Maria Tafuna'i. I am a daughter of Te Mananui Akiwa, the Pacific Ocean, and of course Samoa. My ancestors navigated and settled the largest ocean on this earth using the stars, an achievement that has been compared to space travel. And in the centuries that have passed, our relationship to space has brought us closer we have learned more about space through travel and through satellites. And as a consequence, we have learned more about Earth. It is this knowledge that Space for Planet Earth aims to tap into, to explore and to use to address critical climate change issues in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia and the islands of the Pacific. For me, it is the critical urgency to address climate change that is a timely reminder that Aotearoa in New Zealand is an island group and it is in need for these solutions. Space for Planet Earth aims to inspire the next generation to create innovation that can help solve the biggest environmental issues that we have. And it is not without incentive. Tonight we will hear from experts about the problem itself, but also the current space data tools. This is the third time that Christchurch has hosted a space aerospace challenge since 2018. Also supporting space-based initiatives across the region through Christchurch New Zealand and Christchurch City Council. We are honoured tonight to have Mayor Leanne Dalziel joining us to kick off this Space for Planet Earth Challenge. We also acknowledge that in your final term as Mayor, we take this opportunity to thank you for your support for this co-papa and for the people of Christchurch. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Dalziel.
e na mana e na reo e ro rangatira ma tene te mihi kia koto ite kopa pro te ra tena koto tena koto tena ratato kato kato toi tu te marae a tane mahuta toi tu te marae a tangaro toi tu te tangata if the land is well and the sea is well the people will thrive. It is a privilege to be able to offer a very warm welcome from Ōtātahi, the city of Christchurch, where this Space for Planet Earth Challenge is being hosted virtually by Space Base and Edmund Hillary fellow co-founders and now local residents, um, Eric Dahlstrom and Emmeline um, Putt Dahlstrom. Our city has had the pleasure of hosting the past two New Zealand Space and New Zealand Aerospace Challenges, as we've just heard. And I have to say that I was utterly enthralled when I heard the finalists making their presentations. Um, on, on both occasions, um, it really proved that there was uh, such logic in combining the high school challenge uh, with a slightly different emphasis than the uh, wider challenge, and what, a, what an abundance of great ideas that emerged uh, from that. Uh, not only do we have incredible capacity here in Aotearoa, it is clear that our future is in very good hands. However, time is pressing. UNESCO's vote on the status of Australia's coral reef is a clear and present warning um, and well aligned with this year's challenge, which has been scaled to include Australia and the Pacific Islands again, as we've heard, and I'm so pleased that that is the case. This year brings a focus onto leveraging space technology to address climate change, which is vital for our region. As we know, we have unprecedented access to satellite remote sensing data and technologies that can help us better detect, monitor and measure the changes that are occurring. Analysing this data is critical in making better management decisions and creating policies to reverse the damage caused to our planet. The purpose of the challenge is to enable a broader range of researchers and innovators to take up these tools and help find the solutions we need. There is an incredible alignment with our city's strategic priorities, especially building climate resilience and the super nodes, including aerospace and future transport, where our vision is to position our city and region as the leading place to easily design, build and test cutting edge technology. The challenge has a focus on innovation and rapid prototyping, which is a key strength of our city of talented engineers and advanced manufacturers and brings together students and innovators to create tomorrow's solutions to today's problems. When I look at what is happening in our city, including showcasing how small satellite technology is helping democratise access to space, as well as growing businesses and jobs, and we see exponential advances in tr traditional technology like Im imagery collection, I know that we are the city of the future. But we need to make sure that we succeed in unlocking that future for all. And that is what the Space for Planet Earth Challenge is all about. And there really is no better place to launch that challenge than right here, right now. I hope that you are all up for the challenge. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratarau katoa. In introducing our next guest, We'd like to acknowledge that the US Embassy has been a great supporter of space initiatives in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This year, the Embassy is supporting the challenge as a gold sponsor in the incubator program and the final pitch and awards event in February 2022. Here to represent the US Ambassador is Wes Jeffers. Wes is the Deputy Public Affairs Officer at the Embassy originally from West Virginia, so I'll expect a song later, Wes. Um, he has served as a foreign service diplomat for the US government for 10 years, specializing in foreign policy and international relations. Welcome, Wes.
Tenekoto, tenekoto, tenekoto katoa. Ko Appalachians, te mauna. Ko USA, te motu. Ko Potomac, te awa. No West Virginia, aho. No, ko Jeffers, tokufano. Ko Wesley, toko ngoa. Thank you, Famuina, for the kind introduction. I would like to express my boss and our country public affairs counselors, Leslie Goodman's sincere regret for not being able to be here today. But I have to tell all of you, I just arrived to Wellington a week ago from quarantine, and I'm really excited that I now get to be in Christchurch in only my second week of freedom with all of you tonight. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Her Worship, the Mayor, Leanne Dalziel, representatives from Xera Earth Observation Institute, Planet, and of course, our friends, Emmeline and Eric of Space Base, who have been valuable partners of the US Embassy since their Edmund Hillary Fellowship in 2017. It is my great pleasure to represent the United States Embassy tonight to support Space Base and their Space for Planet Earth Challenge. One of the most groundbreaking areas of collaboration the United States and New Zealand have is space exploration. And we are very fortunate to support Space Base this year with a challenge that addresses immediate climate change threats to the Pacific region. Bold action to tackle the climate crisis is more urgent than ever. Leveraging space technology to address climate change is important to ongoing space and science cooperation between the United States, New Zealand, and the wider Pacific. And this will ensure the relationship between our countries continues to strengthen. The record heat, floods, storms, and wildfires devastating communities around the world underscore the grave risks that we all face. Investing now in stronger climate action will protect future generations from far worse impacts. This is a critical year in a decisive decade. Science tells us that we must dramatically scale up our efforts between now and 2030 if we're to meet the global goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. For this reason, it's important to support new and innovative solutions to address climate change issues, particularly in our coastal areas. The Space for Planet Earth Challenge is an excellent platform for students and entrepreneurs to achieve this. President Biden has returned the United States to the Paris Agreement, uh, committed to reduce US emissions to 50 to 52% below 2005 levels in 2030, and won bipartisan support in Congress for initial steps to meet this ambitious goal. The president has also pledged to double US climate support for developing countries by 2024 and triple adaptation finance. With the new commitments announced at the Leaders Summit on Climate, President Biden convened in April, more than half of the global economy is now committed to reducing emissions in line with the 1.5 degree goal. G7 leaders also committed to end international finance for unabated coal projects this year. The urgency and the stakes are clearer than ever, and the goals and commitments we make this year will be decisive. As President Biden has stated, meeting the moment on climate change must begin with a recognition that every nation has a responsibility and a risk, and every nation is at risk. I want to tell all of you tonight that we must commit now to a healthier and more sustainable future, and the Space for Planet Earth Challenge is steering us in that direction. Thank you. Our next speaker will be looking at the problem area. And this year's challenge focuses on detection and monitoring of carbon sequestration and coral health in the region. Sometimes I think that we aren't quite aware of coral as an everyday living organism because we live in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But outside, the reefs are telling us that they're not healthy, they need help. 
but actually the reefs are telling us that people aren't healthy and they need help. Anthony Burns is here to give us, well, it will be here on video, to give us a summary of the critical problem areas and needs of these topic areas. Anthony is a Kiwi who has always been inspired by the application of emerging technology to deliver solutions that are positive, um, critical impact on lives and societies. He serves as a lead consultant for technical agencies of the United Nations and the World Bank, which employs satellite data as a primary decision-making tool while pursuing development objectives in Central Asia, the South Pacific, and Southern Africa. He was previously Chief Engagement Officer for the Radiant Earth Foundation and held roles at the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, working with multinational organizations and commercial companies. There he deployed emerging data technologies on the International Space Station. He was a senior research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security, focusing on satellite technologies, climate change, and state stability. Anthony is not able to be with us, but sends this video from Australia. Anthony Burns. I'd like to begin by thanking Space Base. To introduce myself, I am a New Zealander whose career and passions have straddled both a long time climate change focus in the Pacific uh, with a career in space in uh, the, the UK, the United States, and increasingly New Zealand and Australia. Um, that includes supporting space based development initiatives and climate change in initiatives. So, on the topic of carbon sequestration, you know, let's begin with UN Red Plus, which is one of the most important initiatives under the Global Climate Change Mitigation Roadmap, um, and in including the release of climate funds that support them based on estimates um, on the amounts of carbon that are sequestered within you know, cer certain territories and certain countries um, and the resources they have. And obviously, that includes um, the Pacific. Um, so in order to better map the extent of blue carbon that is locked up in and around Pacific territories, it's a, you know, it's a vital service that satellite and aerial services are uniquely able to provide. Um, and that includes, you know, both um, the data capture itself, the modeling um, from that data, and, you know, some of the key anal um, an analysis applications um, that are required to really capture the full extent of that, um, you know, um, carbon sequestration. And, you know, it, to particularly do that across the region where there are in many cases, you know, many, many different islands and you're trying to create a composite and trying to understand what, what, what the picture is both now and, and um, you know, trending forwards, which is um, really important. So... You know, to give an example of this, the, the sort of space supported services um, in terms of capturing the data around this is, you know, it includes um, spatial, temporal, and radar, um, you know, um, satellites supported by some some hyperspectral provision um, by aerial and UAV providers based in countries like Fiji, um, with the intention, you know, to reduce particularly Fiji's greenhouse gas emissions and also to implement initiatives to increase the sequestration and storage of greenhouse gases. So, to explain that a little bit, in terms of coral health and satellites and other space-enabled solutions, you know, improving intelligence overall for marine and ocean health processes in the, in the Pacific is, again, really critical for one of the key universities in the Pacific, which have uh, led on utilizing the 170 small satellites um, put in orbit to create the high resolution images to detect coral health um, put put up by the Atlas Project or funded by the Atlas Project have been the University of Melbourne um, and they really are world leaders in some of their analysis um, which again is supported by a number of um, data sources of which though the you know things like the Atlas Project are, are really important and helpful and in which you can see important roles being played by um, you know put, Pacific leads like New Zealand and Australia who can bring aboard, you know, um, real capability in, in satellite provision and analysis and data sharing and partnering and a lot of um, the things which they can work with their Pacific partners on. So Coral Health to me is one of the, like, you know, um, really good ways of showing the power of, of satellite solutions and working with global projects like um, like the Alan Coral Pro um, Atlas Project 
because it you know you, you're adding to what's already there and extending the range and some of the research centers in New Zealand which are starting to look at these sorts of things are you know I think it can easily um, in the end um, be the level that, that some of the Australian partners have been uh, in terms of why a lot of this matters for the Pacific in terms of um, space enabled solutions I think it's good to, to contextualize a little bit further actually uh, and look at you know climate change mitigation and adaptation are both vital parallel roadmaps that Pacific Islands um, need to pursue and you know the needs uh, for financing the type, type of uh, tool development and utilization the world-class research that is required uh, the sort of the, the, the private supported public capacity building that's required uh, with, with Pacific partners um, with a real focus I think on including in-house in-country capability that develops and uses satellite based tools to de uh, develop domestically and within a larger you know sort of um, ICT ICT for D type um, you know um, um, program it is critical because I think again you go from um, you know the, the kind of um, emerging space economies that New Zealand and Australia are for instance and, and look at some of the world-class capabilities that are, that are being developed um, with some of the Pacific partners. And I think you need to gather it all together and focus on what's good for mitigation, what's good for adaption, where do specific things like coral health and carbon sequestration fit together? You know, one, one's linked to mitigation, one's linked to ad, ad, adaption, arguably. So, so how, do you, how do you work together to make sure they're both covered adequately and the different tools and the different roadmaps are used? I think there's real leadership opportunities there for New Zealand, uh, which, you know, it, it's been great to be partly involved in. Um, so how can New Zealand specifically help? I think, indeed, you know, the combination of, of, of you know, data sources, types of tools to analyze them, the general intelligence that can be drawn from them for predictions and, and decision making, the overall power of, of fitting, this in, fitting them into larger modeling of um, you know, climate change impacts are critical. Um, and they're very clearly space enabled um, capability that, that, that we can provide. I think ultimately it's, it's best done in the region. It's both, you know, you need a regional and local set of solutions um, that are attuned to the region and the countries themselves. And I say that, you know, knowing that New Zealand is an emerging sort of space economy and space leader in the region, because I've been involved in a number of projects over the years uh, which have tried to use sort of off the shelf, you know, um, sort of global fit type solutions for tracking climate and, and that some of them are very powerful and they may get you 80 85 percent of the way but the remaining 10 to 15 percent are really important uh in terms of of being very customized and take some of the, the special conditions here um for you know climate change prediction and 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 dealing with local weather patterns and solutions which are tuned very much of the region itself uh, and don't really fit anywhere else. So practically, I think New Zealand's in a great position to help here. You know, I think, I think some of the institutes we're now building, I think of Zera, kind of, you know, the EO Institute's uh, um, fantastic. I think of, you know, again, the remote sensing um, center in, in Auckland. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that MBIE and NZSA and the, and the research community have done, are starting to do together, which I think is great and a really natural way for New Zealand to, um, to you know, embed itself as a, as a leader in space that's also focused on the region and, and is a real partner in um, key issues that we all face around climate change. Um, you know, I think also that there's a lot of opportunity, for instance, around real-time weather data uh, linked to satellites, which I've become to be involved in, which I think, you know, it's a whole, almost a whole other discussion, but I think New Zealand has an opportunity there because of what we have here um, that can that can bring some, you know, some much needed solutions to some of the uh, gaps around weather data, which is so important for, you know, climate change mitigation over the longer term. So finally, what does the future hold in terms of supporting um, this space in the region? I think it begins with, you know, utilizing the power of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning for, you know, essentially problem solving on complex issues across large, you know, large territories, which again, satellite solutions are, you know, most uniquely capable of, of supporting. I've used a lot of AI, the emergent AI ML tools in the Pacific, and I think that they hold tremendous amounts of promise, um, while also requiring tremendous amounts of work to get the full amount out of them. And I think, again, New Zealand and Australia focused in the region, uh, working with Pacific partners, are uh, well-placed to, to bring online those tools and apply them um, in powerful ways. And I think, 
you know, the second aspect of, of what the future holds is, you know, the type of, of comprehensive space-based solutions that will be developed here um, that will be better able to provide the evidence base required to unlock climate financing uh, to, to support scaling of all of these sorts of climate mitigation, climate adaptation programs across the entire Pacific. And what I hope will be a virtuous circle, you know, a better, better data sourced locally provides a better evidential base which ultimately leads to better resourcing and valuing of carbon sequestration itself and the implementation of positive financial support through the likes of UN Red Plus. So I do believe that the future looks bright in this space and I think you know, a, a conference like this is tremendously encouraging and timely as I said at the top because I think that you know, we will get to a place where you know, we will be regional leaders along with Australia in this space and with other partners and the Pacific themselves will be you know, will we'll carry on their own glide path towards self-sufficiency and strength in this area. And ultimately, it will prove the value uh, that New Zealand can bring in terms of uh, supporting Pacific partners with fantastic uh, cutting-edge space solutions derived uh, locally. Was anybody else recalling Max Headroom from the 80s right then? Or was it just, I almost Googled it, but my brain found his name. So um, I, and I guess we'll try and sort out that technical difficulty. Great, thank you. And so actually we're just going to move into this area about remote sensing. So today's tools and satellite data have allowed us to better understand the growing climate change issues we face today at a global scale. We have Duncan, Dr. Duncan Steele with us today, and he'll give us a short summary on how we are leveraging today's space technologies and gaps that are opportunities for innovation. In reading Dr. Duncan's bio, he has done many wonderful things. But they named an asteroid after him, so I would like that to be one of the most wonderful things. So asteroid 4713 Steel is named after Duncan, as is a lunar roving robot in one of Arthur C. Clarke's science fiction novels. I think these are good incentives for the challenge as well. Back to Duncan. So, Duncan is a space scientist, astronomer, and world-renowned author. Over the past 30 years, he has worked on space projects in the US, UK, Australia, Sweden, Canada, and New Zealand. His research focuses largely on asteroids, comets, and meteors, but he's also been involved in planning missions to Mars and search for life elsewhere. Additionally, he's an expert on the history and astronomical basis of calendars. He is the author of four books, over 140 research papers, and more than 1,000 articles in newspapers and magazines published around the globe. He has appeared in dozens of TV documentaries and hundreds of radio interviews. Today, Duncan is a principal research scientist at Zero Earth Observation Institute, creating powerful ways to use Earth observation and remote sensing technologies through tangible products and services that provide evidence-informed decision-making within New Zealand's industries, business and government. Welcome Duncan Steele, Principal Scientist from Zero Earth. Uh, kia ora. thank you for the embarrassing introduction. Um, Lovely to be here. Um, lovely to be back in Christchurch. Uh, I actually took my PhD at the University of Canterbury ooh, 35 years ago, so it's, I'm coming home, I guess, coming down from Nelson today. I've lived all over the place, but yes, um, I uh, started off uh, at the University of London, but then uh, ended up here and uh, doing my doctoral degree, and it's, it's lovely to be back. So, um, can we go back to the beginning? Sorry. I <laughs> Um, I work for a company called Zera, and I'm going to tell you a few things about what Zera does. In essence, Zera was set up uh, to, try and, to try and leverage what space can do for New Zealand. And I'll be talking a little bit about satellite imagery, uh, but I'll be showing you some pictures and some movies, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
So um, how can we use satellite data to uh, chart climate change? The very first thing you want to do, which will be coming up on the next slide any second now, is the first thing you need to do is know what is available. Uh, so what is available? And it's amazing what is available for free. Uh, lovely introduction, thank you very much, to uh, the gentleman from the, from the US Embassy. All US uh, civil agencies make all of their data entirely free to anybody around the world. Thank you. It's really heartfelt, thank you. Uh, so there's many satellites scanning continually from low Earth orbit. Data from many different space agency programs are freely available, but there's also commercially available imagery. So Planet is a sponsor, and Zera is the partner of, of Planet here in New Zealand. Uh, Planet has got more than 200 of those satellites in orbit, and it, it returns images like this. This was just taken last week over, as you can see, the whole of Christchurch. Uh, if you take a look at those, light, those dots along the bottom, there's a dot when an image has been obtained of Christchurch on that day. So it's almost daily coverage, and that's an amazing thing. Okay, that's just totally unavailable until very, very recently. Here's an image of Christchurch, exactly where we are now, taken by one of those satellites last week. Here is a higher resolution image taken by Planet two weeks ago. Okay, these sorts of things are available, I believe, as part of this challenge. Uh, here's the orbits of the satellites which Planet now has in orbit. It's amazing to, to, to comprehend how many satellites there are up there. There's 220 of the CubeSats, which are this big, and there's 21 bigger satellites which are returning the high-resolution imagery. Uh, I made this little video to try and make people a little bit seasick because you're kind of zooming in and zooming out, but it is astonishing to see how many satellites they are. And typically, most of them are coming across New Zealand about 10.30 in the morning. So imagery being collected all the time. Here's an image of White Island, uh, Wakari, taken last week. And we know that we want to study that island after the, the catastrophe which happened there a couple of years ago to see how it's changing. Another New Zealand island, Raoul Island in the Kermadex, it's a great laboratory for looking at climate change because, guess what? Hardly anybody lives there, just a few dock staff who are monitoring the situation. Here's another island, uh, a coral reef, uh, one of the Minerva uh, reef uh, islands between New Zealand and Fiji. So how are coral reefs changing in time? If we can only look at the last year or two, we don't get a whole lot. However, the US Geological Survey has been flying a series of satellites since 1972. It means we have, in essence, half a century of imagery which can be interpreted, all freely available. This is the way in which, for example, US Geological Survey's satellite called Landsat 8 scanned across uh, part of the North Island uh, last year. I put this one together just to show people how satellites actually sc scan the Earth, and that's kind of like in real time. That's how fast that satellite is going and building up that image. If you want that image, freely available for anybody who wants to go and, and pick, pull it off the web. So how is vegetation changing in time, sequestering carbon? If we just take a look at optical images, like our eye can see, we're not going to see a whole lot. Here's an example. Look at the green, it's in, it's in the wonderful gardens in Hamilton, but it doesn't give you a whole lot of detail. However, if you go into the near infrared, vegetation is very highly reflective. And again, now we've got satellites up there which are collecting many, many different spectral bands outside of what we can see with our eyes. So I just wanted to give that as an example. Another example, we've got radar satellites in orbit now. Okay, so Airbus flies this one. It's actually a German satellite called Terrasar X. That's a region around Lake, Lake Ellesmere. And you could see, when it was there, um, the different patterns which you see in fields. You can see how vegetation is growing. Another example here, let's say we want to study water. Look at the color of the water coming out of the Clutha. That's being dumped onto the seafloor and covering up all sorts of things which we would like to be growing freely on the bottom. Here's the colors of lakes in New Zealand obtained using free data. In fact, this data comes from the Sentinel-2 satellites, which are European Space Agency satellites. Again, entirely available for free to anybody. Okay, apart from providing imagery, which I've just shown you some examples of, what other sorts of data be can, can be, we collect in space? Let me give you an example of a platform which my company has recently produced. It's called Starboard Maritime uh, Intelligence. This is what we do. We do worldwide identification and tracking of vessels, in particular looking for illegal fishing vessels or looking for vessels which may be coming in bringing in COVID-19 or bringing in hitchhiker pests, for example, uh, Asian gypsy moth or marmorated stink bug. We actually have ways of detecting these vessels. Uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. Here's the coral reef I showed you an image of just now. Here's another coral reef very close by, North Minerva Reef. Let's take a closer look at it. 
Here is two yachts which we picked up from their automatic identification system uh, at that location. Uh, it was actually last year. Here's an image of that reef taken last week. There are images taken typically once a week of that particular reef. Here's another image taken two years ago. It doesn't look as interesting, does it? But in fact, there's important information in this image, and I'll show you why. Uh, once I do a bit of massaging of that image, I could actually pick out 10 yachts which were, which were anchored there at that time. Now, currently, there are no yachts there. I'm looking at the imagery every day, uh, because if there were yachts there and they were heading for New Zealand, we need to know that. OK, here's the sort of thing we do with this platform. We pick up the automatic identification system using a constellation of more than 50 satellites orbiting the Earth. We can tell where every vessel in the whole of the world is as long as they're sticking to the rules, which is transmitting their, their positions. Here's a map showing all sorts of uh, traffic in and around New Zealand and the Pacific. But we can filter it in very ways. That was too much information. Let's take a look now at a little bit more refined information. I say, I only want vessels coming into the New Zealand exclusive economic zone which are coming from overseas. And that reduces the number. We can also actually assess the risk because we know the history of those vessels over the last two years. So we can assess the risk to New Zealand from, for COVID-19 or for hitchhiker pests. Take a look at that dot up there. It's actually on a path which seems to be a bit crooked and going through the Kermadec Islands. I can take a look at it in more detail. I can click on it in this platform. It tells us it's a yacht called Adventurer. It's come from French Polynesia, and according to our prediction, based upon its speed, it's going to enter Apua at about 2.45 in the morning tonight. Customs and immigration and so on need to know about that yacht. Okay, we can also monitor fishing vessels and, and marine reserves. So here we're looking down south of uh, the main uh, South Island. We're looking down at the Auckland Islands. We can see there's lots of fishing vessels, New Zealand fishing vessels, fishing entirely legally. Every so often, they come in closer to the Auckland Islands in order to take shelter during a storm. That's entirely legal again, but they're not allowed to fish within there. So Department of Conservation needs to know what these vessels are doing. If we take a look at this map across the Pacific, we can see lots of paths in which vessels are apparently fishing. We automatically classify those, and that's when they turn salmon pink, very appropriate color. And we can take a look at those in more detail. So, for example, we ran an operation last year in which we looked at fishing vessels fishing for southern bluefin tuna in the Tasman Sea between the EEZs of Australia and New Zealand. That's legal, except for we found an entirely invisible fleet. I won't say which country it was from because they turned off their automatic identification systems. We task satellites. For example, the Radar Sat 2 satellite is... Um, Canadian, and we task it, it costs us about $10,000 to get an image like that, but it picks up the dark vessels. Final example to show a bit of brinksmanship here, I particularly like this picture, that was the US fishing fleet and the Russian fishing fleet in the Bering Strait, right up against the border between the two. Uh, no diplomatic incidents there, thank goodness. If anybody wants to know more about any of this sort of stuff, please you know, tap me on the shoulder, uh, get a business guide, get in contact. Uh, we make uh, uh, assessment... Uh, licenses for the starboard platform freely available to people so they can try it out. Thanks very much. Uh, just like my ancestors, I continue to voyage um, in the Pacific, so I found that completely so interesting. And I know that many island nations have set up marine reserves, but the ability to monitor those is, um, I guess, almost impossible. So given this type of technology means that we can do more in conserving more spaces. So thank you. Um, satellite com pla Company Planet. Just want to talk a little bit about them, who our next guest comes from. They've played a major role in monitoring the health of planet Earth over this past decade, allowing the ability to observe climate and environmental changes each day. We're excited that Planet has joined forces with Space Base to support the challenge this year in the region. So joining us via video from San Francisco, California, is Planet Vice President of Launch and Regulatory Affairs, Mike Safian. Mike started out at NASA Ames, I hope I'm saying that right, Ames, on the um, PhoneSat project developing low-cost CubeSat platforms and was on the eight-person founding team at Planet Labs in 2011. He has moved through a wide range of roles from export, regulatory licensing and compliance, 
overseeing Planet's global ground station network, to managing Planet's launch strategy, the position he holds today. In his early career at Planet, Mike was responsible for obtaining the company's FCC operational license, the first ever obtained for commercial CubeSat. And since then, he's been involved in the launch of over 300 satellites across 20 different launch attempts, helping Planet's fleet grow to the largest in the world. In 2017, Mike oversaw Planet's record-breaking launch of 88 Dove satellites on in India's PS LV. The launch allowed Planet to achieve its mission one, imaging the entire Earth every day from space. Outside of Planet, he has helped establish the Commercial Small Satellite Spectrum Management Association, an industry organization that advocates for small sat spectrum sharing. Welcome Mike Safian, Vice President of Launch and Regulatory Affairs, Planet. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Safian, and I'm the VP of Launch and Regulatory Affairs at Planet. And I wish I could be there with you in person today, but it is a great honor and pleasure to be talking to Space Base 2021. Today, I'll be talking to you about Planet, who we are, what we do, and what our satellite imagery and data enables. Planet's mission is to image the whole Earth every day and make that information visible, accessible, and actionable. Because at Planet, we believe that you can't fix what you can't see, which is why we've designed, built, and deployed the world's largest fleet of remote sensing satellites. The market forces that have come together to make a company like Planet possible uh, include this concept of agile aerospace. We're borrowing the techniques from Silicon Valley and we're treating our satellites as if they were software, which means that we're rapidly iterating and constantly improving the technology of the satellites and very often borrowing from the commercial electronics industry using commercial off-the-shelf technology. So radios and computer processors and battery technology, all of that is often more powerful, more power efficient and more capable from the commercial world as, a, uh, as opposed to the space world. And we're taking all of that fantastic te technology and putting it into our satellites. The second market force that's been really important is launch access. So here I show a picture of Rocket Lab's Electron, a New Zealand-based launch company, which is doing amazing things in the world of launch. 10, 20 years ago, it was much, much harder to get a small satellite up into orbit. And now there's a plethora of options. And finally, cloud-based platforms. So online platforms like Google Cloud or Amazon's AWS are very economical and scalable and easy to plug into. And that's the type of infrastructure that we need because we're generating terabytes and terabytes of, of Earth imagery data a day. And we use those uh, cloud-based services to store the data, process all that information, and serve it to our users and our customers. As I mentioned, Planet designs, builds, and operates the world's largest fleet of remote sensing satellites. Currently, we have over 180 Dove satellites in orbit, which are scanning the entire Earth at medium resolution, approximately five meters per pixel. And as the Earth rotates, the satellites are all flying in a single orbit for um, rough approximation. And as the satellites are flying overhead, the Earth turns and we can scan the entire Earth at roughly every 24 hours at medium resolution. And the other uh, fleet of satellites that we currently have operating is called the SkySats. And that's our high resolution satellite fleet. So there's 21 of those flying up in orbit right now in a variety of different orbits. So some of them are in sun synchronous orbits crossing in the morning. Others are in sun synchronous crossing in the afternoon. And finally, we have uh, a block of satellites that are in mid latitude which enables very frequent revisit, sometimes uh, more than 10 times a day, of being able to see the same place on Earth with very high resolution. So SkySats operate at 50 centimeters per pixel. 
And this combination of global scan on a near daily basis with tasking satellites where you can zoom in, quote unquote, to look more closely at specific areas has never existed before. This is a, a new and unique data set to humanity. One of the ways that we keep our technology fresh and up to date and at the leading edge of what's possible is with frequent launches. So we've launched over 450 satellites in the company's history uh, across 33 launches. And yes, we've had a handful of launch failures, but that's just part of the business when you're dealing with rockets and we're able to mitigate that by working with lots of different launch providers. So I mentioned Rocket Labs New Zealand is a great example of a very close launch partner that we have, but we also launch with SpaceX, with the Indian Space Agency, and with others as well. In terms of the industries that benefit from Planet's data, government, so defense and intelligence and civil agencies are big consumers of our data, but uh, there's a lot of commercial and scientific nonprofit uses as well in, in terms of agriculture, forestry, mapping, disaster response, the list goes on. And we at Planet truly believe that the purpose of the company is to use space to help life on Earth. And when the UN set out their sustainable uh, development goals, the SDGs, we took a look and saw that 14 of the 17 SDGs could be helped by the use of satellite imagery. And so one great example is monitoring deforestation. So we've partnered with the government of Norway to create this program called NICVI, where we can, where we're monitoring the world's forests uh, in plus or minus 30 degree latitude and making that information available to scientists and researchers all around the world so we can help stop deforestation, um, some, in some cases even before it happens. Another great example is uh, our monitoring of coral reefs. So we've, we've partnered with, with a number of uh, nonprofits and uh, scientific agencies to be able to map the world's coral reefs at, at a scale and coverage that's never been done before. Because one of the first steps to preservation is just understanding where are these reefs in the first place. And so to summarize, the traditional approach to remote sensing typically involves building one or two billion dollar school bus size satellites that uh, are able to capture with either very high resolution or very high scientific quality, but their coverage and revisit is, is actually quite low. And so oftentimes they're, they're chasing the news uh, instead of understanding what's happening in near real time. Today, we have Planet's fleet of uh, near daily global updates with high res follow-ups. And that allows us to actually understand trends as they evolve and even do some predictive types of applications so that we can get ahead of a lot of these challenges that are so critical to mitigating the global climate crisis. And where this is going in the future? Well, machine learning and AI. So the number of the, the amount of data that we're generating on a daily basis, the terabytes of data of Earth imagery is way too much for any single person or even entity or government agency to be able to truly understand everything that's locked inside of all of those pixels. So we need these machine learning or AI-based automated algorithms to be able to automatically, uh, automatically extract um, features and, and insights from the imagery. So things like automatically detecting roads or buildings or trees. And um, this allows for uh, non-remote sensing experts to also benefit from this data. So uh, the, the information can just get into the hands of, of more and more people. So with that, I will leave you with, with one question, which is, what would you do if you could see daily change of the Earth? And this isn't a hypothetical. This data is being produced on a daily basis and is available now. So I really encourage you to check out our website, planet.com. And if you go to planet.com slash trial, you can sign up for a trial account where you can play around with uh, uh, some sample data sets and see some of the, the tools that we've built to do some basic analysis of that data. And in general, I think the space part is super cool. Satellites are really cool. Rockets are really cool. But ultimately, what I think is super exciting is what can people on Earth do with this data to help life on Earth, to help us better manage and take care of our planet. Thank you very much.
we'll send that audio recording of the clapping to uh, Mike. Um, so what's becoming really clear for me is the amount, not just the amount of data, but the amount of sharing and goodwill and intention that you can take what is the information that is coming from space to help us on Earth. And that those who we're hearing from who are assisting in this challenge are all interested in how do we take that data and how do we not just innovate, but how do we then, I guess, protect our planet, protect our peoples? How do we capture the imagination of young people to fully participate as a planet citizen? In thinking about planet data, we now have a good idea of the state of coral health, and we saw an image there from our next speaker, who comes from Alan Coral Atlas, who has mapped, uh, looks at the global state of coral. Brianna Bambic will give a short introduction about their coral database and how it can support the challenge. Brianna manages the field engagement team for the Allen Coral Atlas at the National Geographic Society in Washington, DC. And with a coral reef restoration background, she was an independent researcher for seven years, helping communities, uh, helping communicate science to the public. Her expertise includes coastal and marine management, community engagement and outreach with over 700 dives. I quite like this part because there is the data from space and the ground truthing on Earth and in the water. And so she also has a geographic focus in the Caribbean. Brianna Bambic. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm overjoyed to share the Allen Coral Atlas, a new tool for coral conservation. Thanks, Emmeline and Space Base for organizing the Space for the Planet Challenge. What a great way to ignite some new ideas. First, I'd like to highlight this has been a true team effort. This co-author list is just a subset of those working on the Atlas. I'm Brianna Bambic, a coral reef biologist by training and virtual reality producer as a National Geographic Explorer. Now I'll lead the field engagement team. And I'd first like to invite you to all explore allencoralatlas.org. To set the stage, our team has a few goals for today. We want to share the Allen Coral Atlas mapping and monitoring tools so you have a basic understanding if you want to use them in your project. We also hope to connect with the space-based community so you all have access to not only the Atlas platform, but also the training courses and resources we have freely available. And of course, we encourage all follow-ups and questions. The Atlas team started with two major challenges. As Charles Darwin discovered, mapping reefs is not as straightforward as observing and mapping land. And as coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse and threatened ecosystems on the planet, how are they still largely unmapped and unmonitored? And how are we supposed to protect what we don't know? So the Atlas is overcoming these challenges twofold by creating the world's first globally consistent map and dynamic monitoring system of the world's shallow coral reefs. It started with Planet Inc. and Andrew Zoli's fleet of over 150 Dove satellites, pictured here. The central portion is about the size of a loaf of bread. These satellites can remotely sense the planet with high resolution imagery. Then, Arizona State University's unique ability to essentially remove the seawater corrects for cloud, sun, and wave reflectance. We will use this satellite image of Heron Reef, Australia as an example. In the top left corner, you can make out the actual island and the surrounding reef. Here you can see an incredible level of detail. First the image, next the map. Here, University of Queensland's Remote Sensing Research Center uses field data collected by survey teams and existing data sets to generate the maps with object-based analysis and machine learning techniques. Each color represents a different benthic class. For example, microalgal maps, sand, and the coral algal combined layer, down to a depth of 10 meters. 
The Atlas also provides the first ever globally consistent geomorphic map layer, condensing dozens of reef categories into 12 globally consistent geomorphic classes, down to 15 meters. Next, the Atlas also includes a quarterly turbidity monitoring system by Arizona State University. This is a sample turbidity image since it is for download only and shows the highest level of turbidity per pixel for the quarter at 10 meter resolution. Curious minds could look into how land and sea interact around the world using this turbidity monitoring system. To show you the newest Atlas feature, which detects global coral bleaching, let's travel to a beautiful island in Indonesia. This archipelago was monitored July 5th of this year. As surface temperatures became warm, NOAA's Global Coral Reef Watch sends bleaching alerts, as shown in yellow. So, when a region signals a bleaching alert, the Atlas Bleaching Detection Tool is initiated. Here, we are going to zoom into the north of the archipelago. You are able to see different bleaching severities across the islands, shown by low bleaching in yellow, moderate in orange, and severe in red. We are curious how you might use the Allen Coral Atlas Bleaching Detection Tool. We hope these new marine technology tools spark some curiosity, and here are a couple more suggestions I have from working with researchers and conservationists worldwide. One need is identifying biodiverse areas that have multiple stressors to identify priority for conservation. Another potential use is identifying erosion and monitoring the surrounding area. How can you scale this up? Or how can you find patterns in coral health and connectivity? What IUCN red list species do we want to include in this monitoring effort? And how do we inform policy? Do we want to identify best practices by countries? Potentially approaching marine spatial planning and conservation priorities? Up to you. This is a short introduction and we have plenty of resources on the Atlas website and the YouTube channel, including this online course to keep your wheels spinning on how to use remote sensing and mapping for coral conservation. Here's a list of links for the online course resource. And we of course encourage all types of communication, especially in the virtual world. You can sign up for the newsletter to hear about new features, try out some of the tools and the data downloads. Please let us know how we can be of assistance. Reach us at these emails. And lastly, good luck everyone with the Space for Planet Earth Challenge. We would love to hear about your project or proposal that might integrate the Atlas. Please let us know so we can highlight your work. See you out there. It gives me a particular pleasure to invite our next speaker. Uh, so this, our challenge, the Space for Planet Challenge is being managed and delivered by Christchurch's Space Base, a social enterprise focused on catalyzing space ecosystems in emerging and developing countries starting in New Zealand. Emmeline Part Dahlstrom will talk about the process of participating, the requirements and the schedule of the challenge. Originally from the Philippines, Emmeline is a co-founder and CEO of Space Base, a fellow of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship and the Institution, Institute of Space Commerce. She's an alumni and New Zealand ambassador for the International Space University and has worked on program development, operations, space tourism and educational and management for the space industry for over three decades in the United States and in Europe. A former Chief Impact Officer and Exec VP of Singularity University, she continues to teach and mentor space startup companies around the globe. And I'm very proud to say a fellow friend as well. Welcome, Emily. Here I everyone. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like 
on behalf of Space Base to thank you for actually uh, being here, either in person or online, uh, for the launch of the Space Challenge. We're really excited to see how in six, week, six months' time, uh, what innovation is going to come out of, uh, of this challenge. So I'm going to talk about the mechanics and the process of the challenge. So the challenge uh, this year has two categories. Uh, one is high school, uh, and uh, the other one is uh, university and, and startup. Uh, the requirements for the challenge is pretty simple. Uh, basically, you either are a high school student or a university student. Uh, you could be a startup, and startup is pretty broad. Um, we basically wanted to make it simple. Any uh, individual entrepreneur organization or company that is less than uh, 20 employees, uh, just to make it simple. Um, and then also that you're a resident of uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. The initial pro uh, proposal applications is now open, starting from today until the end of October. So there are two problem statements uh, for the challenge. The first one for the high school category is coral health. Um, the problem statement is help improve the monitoring of coral health changes due to climate change using satellite technology. So examples of this is uh, how do you distinguish live coral from algae cover? Um, or how can you validate coral bleaching hotspots for local regions? And as you can see, we're collaborating with the uh, Allen Coral Atlas to leverage their research and also their database uh, for this challenge. For the university and uh, startup level, uh, the focus is carbon sequestration. Uh, using satellite data in combination with other data sources uh, help develop verifiable methods to measure carbon sequestration on land or uh, coastal areas. So examples of this is uh, how do you improve measurement of carbon sequestration in forests, native bush, pastures, wetlands, or coastal zones? And then uh, can you monitor the changes in extent of these carbon sequestration zones? So we've uh, partnered with Planet uh, for their data, uh, but also we're going to be utilizing, as Duncan mentioned, all of the free data available sets from NASA, ESA, NOAA, and uh, US, um, USGS. So after the, uh, the proposal application period, we're going to uh, basically select up to uh, 30 top proposals, and we're going to be inviting them to a virtual, um, virtual incubator, which will run between November 2021 to January 2022. Uh, if you are a participant of the virtual incubator, you're basically going to be supported through webinar sessions on the technology um, available, um, as well as tools, uh, access to satellite data, and, and also mentorship. Now, to participate in the uh, virtual incubator, you need to just uh, submit a proposal by October 31st. It's a two to 10 page, and uh, uh, basically the proposal is either you tell us about the, the team that you're going to be um, uh, participating with, we want to know your general technique approach on the problem, uh, what aspect of the problem are you actually addressing, and then an outline of your project plan and your schedule as well as specific requests for uh, technical support. After the incubator program, uh, we are also uh, going to then uh, ask for the final application, which is not due until the 31st of January. The final application requirement is essentially five minutes of video of what you've actually uh, created for your solution, and then a presentation desk deck. Uh, one thing to note is that you can actually submit a final application in January without participating in the incubator program. Um, after that, we will be down selecting three finalists for each of the uh, categories, so a total of six, and we'll be inviting them to participate in the demo and pitch session on 18 of February uh, in, here in Christchurch. So the judging criteria is going to be the same for all of the evaluation um, a period from evaluating for the incubator, the finalist down selection, and also for the final pitch. So the criteria are the use of space technology to address the problem, a technical feasibility, so it has to be scientifically uh, um, based um, 
and then the innovation solution should be novel and the new idea. An implementation plan uh, should be easy and adaptable and to, and to scale. We're looking for maximum environmental impact as well as um, your prototype or the demonstration of your solution to the challenge. You get an extra point um, if you have evidence of impact for within the next three years, uh, collaborating with multiple stakeholders, as well as uh, creative integration, so using other technologies as well. Uh, and, then the, and then also the team composition. So what do you get for the challenge? Um, for both levels, there's going to be cash prize. For the university level, you'll um, receive $30,000 and for the high school level, $10,000. There is a $15,000 equivalent of data vouchers from Planet, as well as mentorship for six months from Spacebase. And then for the high school level, you also get a scholarship up to six of members of your team to the US-based Mars Moon Virtual Astronautics Academy program. So, the challenge is open now. Uh, you can uh, basically apply at the website for spaceforearth.org. And then also we're running a series of online briefings uh, starting next week. Um, the first one is on 11 August at 7.30 p.m. If you have any questions about the challenge, so this is an informal way of, of asking uh, for more uh, information. So we have a few uh, asks. Well, from the audience here. So for, for one, like we're inviting you to apply, but also please help us promote. So we're promoting to New Zealand, we're promoting to Australia, and, and also to the Pacific Islands. We're also still recruiting for mentors, evaluators, and collaborators for the incubator program. So uh, please let us know um, if you're interested. And then uh, as well, we're still looking for sponsors. So for us, we thought that uh, this program and project is really important enough that uh, we've started even though we're still fundraising. So uh, please consider uh, becoming a sponsor to the challenge. Um, and lastly, I wanted to make sure that we thank our partners and sponsors for which uh, without them, I mean, this challenge would actually not be uh, made possible. So to our lead partner, uh, Planet, for the technology and the data, uh, thank you. And then for our sponsors, the US Embassy in New Zealand, Christchurch NZ, the New Zealand Space Agency, uh, part of MB, Greenlight Ventures, Namaste Foundation, M Mars Academy, and the Christchurch City Council. We also want to thank our collaborators for helping us promote the challenge. The Edmund Hillary Fellowship, the Allen Coral Atlas, Warp 42, Agritech NZ, and Humanitech Red Cross Australia. Uh, thank you to the New Zealand uh, Student Space Association Christchurch chapter for actually helping us with the logistics of this event. And, and of course, uh, to say the least, not the least, uh, our fellow EHF fellow, Fomina, for actually uh, doing the emceeing for, for this event. So over on to the host. About five years ago, I was involved in a climate change education program around the Pacific Islands that included Nui, the Cook Islands, Samoa, Fiji, the Marshall Islands. And we invited these young people to think about what if I do nothing? And hearing about all the, the effects of climate change, which for them, when just at their door, they were you know, about to cover the the graves of their ancestors. They were about to swallow up their roads. They were about to affect their crops and livelihoods and also for some of them, take their own people away from the land of their ancestors and move them into the suburban areas of Australia and New Zealand. So the, pro the invitation was to imagine the problem and imagine if they did nothing, what would their lives be like? What would the future generations be like? And so they actually lay on the floor and closed their eyes and thought about this. And then the second invitation is, what if we do something? And this invitation of space for planet Earth, the invitation is there with tools 
It's there with mentors and sponsors who come on board to support this. This is not an invitation in a dark, empty space. It's actually an invitation that brings together the best of knowledge that we have in the space industry, the best of the goodwill and intention, and matches it with those who actually potentially have the answers around critical climate change. So I do invite you to share this kaupapa, this challenge to all of your networks. Just as we can map from the space, we can also map those we all know who are in our email inboxes and contact addresses and in our cell phones to get behind this. Because it's only in spreading those words, human to human, that we can actually help solve these critical problems. So we're going to invite you in this next step to actually discuss this. We hope that you're inspired by the people that you've heard on video, the people who have been on stage. And that inspiration may, means that you will move to action. Because all of this, if there's no action, you will be in the same space of imagining if we do nothing. We're not here to do nothing. We are here to do something for future generations, for this planet, for citizens of planet Earth. Ngā mihi ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.